Tonight's episode is brought to you by a service I created, Cryptid Crate. Cryptid Crate is the first and only monthly box subscription service for fans of cryptozoology. Each month you get a surprise in your mailbox filled with books, DVDs, t-shirts, artwork, jewelry, and a plethora of other cryptid-themed items. Visit cryptidcrate.com to order your box today and use coupon code MONSTERS88 for a cool 10% off your first crate. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Good evening indeed. It's another nasty day here in Southern California. They're calling for some snow, but right now we're just getting pelted with rain off and on, mixed with fog and other nasty weather. The good news is that our lake, Lake Arrowhead, is actually at full capacity for the first time in I don't know how long, possibly 10 years or so. So that's kind of exciting. I have a great show lined up for you guys, at least I think I do. I'm going to do something a little weird, and I'm doing this mostly for my enjoyment. Tonight's episode is a grab bag episode, so I have not heard any of these stories that I'm about to play. The only thing I know is the name of the person that submitted it and vaguely what it's about. So I'm going to try to arrange these in a way that they play well off of each other. I have no real reason for doing it this way, I just thought it would be a fun way to... Uh, put together an episode this week, so hopefully this goes well, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. Now, before we get started, I have a humongous announcement to share with you guys. I just found this out maybe an hour ago, and I'm pretty excited about it, so I wanted to share right away. I will be this year's guest speaker for the town hall meeting at the 2019 Crypticon in Lexington, Kentucky. Now, the dates for this aren't until September, so you have plenty of time to arrange travel and You know, that kind of thing, if it's something you're interested in attending. I actually hosted this meeting last year and had a great time doing it. We uncovered a handful of of good stories from the area and covered some calls that uh, we've listened to in the past, and I believe I even hinted at a few fresh calls that haven't been shared yet. Crypticon is an incredible event, and if you can make it, I highly, highly recommend you do so. And there will be plenty of more information to come on that. And lastly, before we get uh, too deep into the show here, uh, a couple episodes ago I mentioned something about uh, ghosts in uh, veterinary offices. Uh, I kind of pondered the idea that, uh, you know, hospitals seem to be haunted frequently, so I was wondering if veterinary offices are the same way. And uh, we actually got a couple responses, so I'm going to read through those right now. The first coming from Jude in Texas. Hi, Derek. I wanted to comment on your recent request for animal hospital slash clinic hauntings. I have been working at an animal hospital here in San Antonio for the past six years and unfortunately haven't had any encounters with ghost pets, but I am not sure I would expect any either. This is because, though there are a lot of deaths in these hospitals, many of the pets that are taken to the vet are rather unwilling to be there. I would seem to think that if a creature didn't want to be somewhere when it was alive, there is little chance that they would want to be there after they have passed. Also, by law, any pet that is left in our care after death is sent to a crematorium and either their ashes are returned to the owners or are often spread over funeral ground gardens. If you subscribe to some of the ghost lore out there, this would also make animal hospital hauntings less likely because most supernatural beliefs about ghosts have them tied to the remains in some way and some superstitions say that burning a body is the best way to prevent hauntings in the first place. Personally, I think it would be kind of cool to have ghost pets wandering around the halls of my work at night, but to no avail. 
Anyhow, thank you as always for the wonderful podcast, and keep up the good work. And our second bit of information here was submitted anonymously. Hey man, I was listening to your latest episode, Season 7, Episode 1, and you had mentioned that you'd like to hear about animal ghost stories. I immediately thought of a strange encounter I had when I was about 7 years old in Arlington Heights, Washington. I was staying the night at a buddy's house, we were both guitarists, and he lived in the mother-in-law house on his parents' property, so we would play as loud as we wanted whenever we wanted. Both the main house and the separate building were very strange in that they were once the home of a large-scale drug operation in the 70s. There are little cubby holes everywhere that, as I understand, at one time had framed pictures covering them, and the upstairs room in his mother-in-law house had a large metal door with a multi-digit padlock on it. The story I received from my friend wasn't very detailed, but he said the property was fronted as a child's daycare when the operation was in production back in the day. He also said the building had bullet holes riddled through the front of the wall as a drive-by shooting had taken place, claiming the lives of one of the occupants and, as he believed, their dogs. Now the strange stuff. We used the upstairs room as our practice space, and one night while we were jamming away, this plywood covering over a strangely placed crawl space blew in our direction as if it had been kicked from the inside. This was when he first told me, nonchalantly, in his hippie, meh, who cares voice, Oh, she does that all the time. I didn't mention the ghost. I laughed it off, and I still think it was just weird pressure in this stuffy upstairs room. His girlfriend did come home while we were jamming, so maybe her opening the door caused this thing to pop off. There were other times, at later dates, that I could hear things crashing around up there, but he'd just say, Oh, she's throwing a fit again. But, back to the first night and on to the dogs. We head to bed around 2 a.m., and I take to the couch. I kick off my shoes and socks and pull my coat over me as a makeshift blanket. All the lights are turned off as we doze away to one of the strangest, kind of hilarious, vinyl albums I've ever heard. The Zodiac, Cosmic Sounds. Give it a listen, it's a true lost treasure from the 70s. Then, in this pitch black room, I hear literally, out of thin air, a dog sniffing, loudly. What the hell is that, Chris? I whisper yelled to him. Nonchalantly again, he replied, Oh, I didn't mention the ghost dogs? It sniffed around me. I feel a wet dog nose on my face. I even felt it lick my feet with a slimy dog tongue. My face and feet were still dry. I checked it immediately. I heard it panting for a few breaths, and then it was just gone. This is the weirdest thing I have ever had happen to me. We weren't under any kind of influence that night either. He said that there are multiple dogs and that they come at least once a week, but that is the only experience I had with them. I mean, I felt the sensation of wet and slimy saliva, but it wasn't there. So weird. Thanks for the podcast. Helps me keep on keeping on. Well, thank you to both of those submitters. To be quite honest, I expected to hear more about ghostly experiences found within veterinary offices, but uh, perhaps the night is still young, so to speak. Now, as I said, I think I have a great episode lined up for you guys, so let's get on into it. Our first true call of the evening actually deals with dogs. The following is Eric's story from the state of Washington. Hello, Derek. This is Eric in Southern California. I am uh, somewhere between Palm Springs and uh, Riverside, just to give you an idea. I was just listening to the show, thought I'd call in because I remember your affinity for the paranormal and dogs. So I wanted to share what happened to me just last night. In any case, uh, sitting on the couch last night, uh, my dog, my grandmother was right next to the kitchen in the dining room. Uh, my aunt was in her bedroom and uh, all the lights were on um, in the kitchen, dining room, living room. It's a two-bedroom apartment. So uh, all of a sudden, my dog comes up to me while I'm laying sideways, and he sits directly in front of me with, uh, he's a medium-sized uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier, with his chest up against my forehead, and then he rests his chin on the top of my head, and I thought it was a very endearing and sweet uh, thing for him to do 
uh, until he started growling. And I noticed that his head is not turned toward my grandmother, who was towards that direction near the kitchen, but actually over the bar, overlooking the sink and looking into the kitchen. And I lift up and he won't break his gaze and he's growling at something he looks like he's looking at the ceiling of the kitchen and something antagonizes him enough and i'm looking in his eyes to see if there's a reflection because there's no one in the kitchen uh there's no moth or anything flying in the light nothing that i can see with my eye but i'm looking into his eye to see if i can see something my i wanted to see a person uh standing in there through the your gloss of his eye the reflection but I don't know if that was just what I wanted to see or what I was actually seeing. But he started barking, and uh, he, he's a good protector for me. And he actually uh, made his way to the kitchen as if the same way he would interact with a, a person or uh, another animal uh, that uh, was trying to get close to me or something like that. So it was very interesting. He went in the kitchen, and he, he prowled around and looked at the ceiling and double-checked and walked in, walked out just to make sure the thing was gone. Uh, oddly enough, though, after that, uh, I gave him a essential oil flea and tick treatment, and he went to my grandmother's bedroom, which also had a light on. I didn't pay it any mind. I know he'd get comfortable on her bed, and he probably wanted to roll around. Well, we hear this loud, slow commotion in her bedroom, uh, and I go in there, and he's walking out, He doesn't seem like he did anything bad, but he knew I called his name. And when I go in there, the nightstand uh, on the other side of the bed, it's just on a glass table. Uh, The table itself is glass and then a steel frame underneath. But the lamp and books, it was like someone had tilted it and slid the things off of the table. Um, If he had rolled off the bed and onto the table, uh, maybe he could have you know, flipped it to where the glass wouldn't break, but uh, leaned to enough to knock everything off. Uh, Very strange, very odd. Um, I slept just fine last night. Well, actually, I was up at 3 a.m., not out of fear or anything like that. Uh, I sleep in the living room. But, yeah, I was definitely, that's been on my mind. So I haven't had him encounter anything paranormal like that. Uh, I've never seen him do that before, but uh, last night was the first. So anyway, yeah, there's a shout out to the dogs uh, that are ghost hunters as well. Hey, all right. Well, I hope all is well. Happy holidays uh, or happy new year, wherever this may find you. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Now, my immediate thought was that perhaps your dog was reacting to a sound rather than something visual. A dog's hearing is considerably better than ours, so it's possible that something outside or perhaps even on your roof, may have captured his attention. Now, otherwise, this type of activity is reported quite often. In fact, having three cats myself, I can tell you I've caught them staring into corners more than once. And each time, it's just as creepy as the last. I don't know what they're looking at, but I'd definitely like to know. Thank you again for taking the time to submit. And staying in the state of California... Our following call comes to us from Noah. Hi, Derek. My name is Noah. I'm calling from Los Angeles, California, and I got a weird one for you. So to this day, I haven't really heard any similar reports of this kind of ghostly encounter. If it was a ghost, I'm still on the fence about what it was. So what happened when I was in fourth grade, we, uh, our class took a three day trip to this place called Astro Camp, um, high up in the mountains of Idlewild, California. It's in the middle of the woods, very secluded, pretty spooky. Um, it seemed to be a uh, converted military base. So, uh, our lodging was what used to be what, what I'm assuming was uh, old barracks. And there were uh, two bunk beds uh, per room, so four people in a room total. And the first night, I woke up to something squeezing my hand. Uh, It was very warm, and so I opened my eyes, 
thought it was my flashlight because I knew I fell asleep with it on just because I, I had some troubles with the dark at that time in my life. But anyways, so wake up and I look for my flashlight. Uh, turns out it was turned off and it was off the bed um, by on the floor by my feet. So couldn't be a couldn't have been the flashlight that touched my hand. So I look to the center of the room and I see this tall black figure. It's probably around six feet tall, no discernible features, and it was just kind of swaying from side to side. Now this thing was solid black, and I thought it was one of my roommates. So I tried talking to it. I'm like, hey, what's up? Is everything okay? No answer. It just kind of was there swaying from side to side. And the room was very hot. Uh, I would say it was somewhere 80 degrees, um, which is unusual for a ghostly sighting. Uh, I know usually it's a cool, cooler environment, breeze, whatnot, but it was very hot. The air was very still. And so I tried talking to this thing maybe about like 20 seconds. And then I realized, okay, this is a bit weird. So I got out of my bed and I checked the other bunks. Everyone else in the room was fast asleep. So I, and I was able to walk around this thing. I didn't try to touch it or anything like that because I didn't know what it was. So I walk around, check the bunks and this thing's just in the center of the room. Um, and so pick up my flashlight uh, sit back on my bed, try talking to it again, you know, asking if everything's okay, like, you know, what's going on. And then I shine my flashlight on it. And as I move my flashlight towards where it's standing, it kind of sinks into the ground. And it's just kind of a black circle on the ground. And it moves towards the door of the room. And right before it hits the door, it pops back up. And the best way I could describe it is it's sort of like folded into the door. So at that point, I was like, okay, this is super weird. Now, at this time in my life, the only paranormal stuff I believed were UFOs and Bigfoot. Um, I thought ghost was a ridiculous concept, dead people coming back to life, all that. So I was super weirded out. I walk out of my room towards the teacher's lounge, um, just kind of report what happened um and there was already a parent chaperone in the hallway kind of like you know fast-paced walking towards me and he asked is everything okay and i said well i just saw something in my room and i i don't know what to make of it and it kind of creeped me out and he said yeah i heard you scream so i didn't scream at all uh the only talking i did in my room was trying to make contact with this entity and um and i didn't hear any screams coming from any of the rooms so i tell the chaperone what i saw at that point when he mentioned you know he heard a scream when there was none i got pretty freaked out so i asked the chaperone if he could just you know chill out in my room for a bit you know as i try to fall back asleep so that's what happened the following morning, uh, the chaperone comes straight to me first thing in the morning. And he says, hey, like, don't tell anyone what you saw last night. We don't want any of the other kids freaking out. He was concerned it was someone else going around, like some other adult or something, being a creep and just going around in rooms. So, like, I was like, yeah, I won't tell anyone. So, didn't tell a soul. The following night, I get woken up by... Uh, someone yelling so one of my roommates yelling and wake up I asked everything is okay and he told me he saw a man standing in the room reaching out towards him now at that point just to comfort him I was like well this happened to me last night so he contacted the same chaperone chaperone stayed in a room overnight and the following morning he told me and the other roommate it's like, hey, like, I was hearing footsteps in your room while, while I was in there. So to this day, I really don't know what it was. I'm hesitant to call it a ghost or 
whatever it was just it was very odd and i'm curious to get your take on this encounter uh love your show uh keep up the good work and i'm looking forward to hearing this episode all right all the best bye thank you noah now i'm quick to dismiss stories like this as sleep paralysis after all many elements of that terrible sleep disorder jive with the reports that I usually receive. But obviously, that's not the case with Noah's story. Not only did he get up and move around the object, but a chaperone also heard a strange scream, and it seems that the next night, a fellow camper also saw this entity. So whatever it is, I would go out on a limb and say it's most likely not sleep paralysis. But that does raise another question. Why are summer camps so creepy? Uh, I love this story. I think it's it's wildly entertaining, and there's just something weird about it that I can't quite explain. So thank you, Noah, for taking the time to share your encounter. Our next story of the evening comes to us from a practical neighbor of mine. The following is Angela's story, also from the state of California. Hi, this is Angela from Crestline, California. My story is a hard one to tell because it's probably pretty unbelievable even to me. Most people are going to say it's a dream. I've had um, where, you know, it, it is that where it feels like someone's sitting on your chest and you see a demon um, sleep paralysis, I believe it's called. And um, that I definitely believe is sleep paralysis as weird and scary as it is and this was nothing like that and it did happen in the same house so this takes place when I was about 16 or 17 years old I was still living with my parents so that would be around 1997 it was in Villa Park California I was sleeping it was early morning probably I would guess the sun was coming up so uh, it was summertime. I was kind of waking up, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw two or three huge shadow figures standing around my bed. And they were just shadows. I didn't see any details. Almost see-through, because I could see through my room and the light, but I could feel their presence more than anything. And I had my hand over my pillow. So I, I saw this real quick, and then I closed my eyes because I was just in fear, terror. Like, the most terror I've probably ever felt in my life at that moment. That's why I really feel, to me, it was not a dream because I was so awake and so afraid, and I was just closing my eyes so tight, hoping what I saw was not there and um, just saying little prayers like, go away, go away. So my hand's above my pillow, and then I feel weight in my hand, like something got placed into my hand. And I slowly kind of open my eyes just a little bit to see, and I see this vial, this glass vial. It just sounds so ridiculous even saying this out loud. I've told hardly anyone. But this is what I saw, and it had this liquid in it, this pink liquid, And they wanted me to drink it. And I was like thinking, I am not drinking this. So I just kept closing my hand, my eyes, keeping my hand there and not moving it and just holding as still as I could. And I know it wasn't like sleep paralysis because I could talk. I was saying little prayers, whispering little prayers to myself. But I was so scared. I could not yell out for my mom or my dad or anyone else that lived in the house. And I was just. Um, praying they would go away, closing my eyes tight, and just staying like that. And eventually I felt the vial be lifted out of my hand, and I moved my hand back under my pillow, and then I just kept closing my eyes, too afraid to look if they were gone or not, until I fell asleep. And it was probably like, I don't know, I was a teenager, 10 or 11, and then I woke up and everything was fine and everything was, you know, back to normal, but... So that's my story. I haven't really had anything else like that happen. Me, no alien stuff. 
I have had stuff which I thought was ghosts, but I don't know what that's really like. Um, I just see things out of the corner of my eye, and I can get in my mind completely what that, uh, if it is a ghost, was wearing, what they look like, and everything. And even one time when I used to work in L.A., I was driving back, and I saw what I thought was uh, a ghost. I looked up if there was a crash on that corner, and... A guy came up that died in the accident, and he looked exactly like what I thought I saw driving past. So that's probably the most, um, you know, relevant one that I've had. But, um, yeah, it's just I don't really know what they were, what it was. I really don't think it was a dream. I hope it was a dream, but that's my story. And uh, good luck during this next storm that we're going to have hit us. I hope everything goes good. And nothing floods. And have a great Christmas day tomorrow. See you all later. Bye. Thank you, Angela. I've been talking to Angela a good bit on Instagram, actually. Going back and forth on a couple of these stories. And living a few miles apart, we've been comparing uh, weather horror stories. But that said, if you are a angler, if you are a fly fisherman, especially in uh, the Southern California area, you may want to look up Angela's company, deep creek outfitters i know they do guided tours in our area to catch brookies and stuff like that so if that's something you're interested in hit up uh hit up angela's page on instagram it's just deep creek outfitters i'm sure you can can find it there now as for her story like noah's previous call this also does not sound like sleep paralysis to me now granted it's obvious i'm no doctor or sleep specialist The actions Angela described uh, seem, again, at least to me, too complicated to be performed while suffering a night terror. As someone that's experienced sleep paralysis a handful of times, I can tell you that a majority of your body is completely frozen. Um, Sometimes you can move your eyes and you can sort of utter some sounds, but you can't seem to move your mouth or lips in any way. But then again, it's important for us to keep in mind that The human memory is not nearly as accurate as we think it is. So perhaps uh, some of the movements she remembered were not actually realistic. They were simply in her head. I'd also like to mention that uh, I'm very proud of Angela for researching the corner she saw the strange figure at. Research like that goes a long way to help not only prove a sighting, but to ease a witness's mind. I can imagine it would drive someone crazy to think about this strange entity that they saw and they had no basis for where it came from or what it is or anything like that. So with at least a little bit of research, you can kind of fit a face and name to an entity, so to speak. Thank you, Angela, for taking the time to share your story. And this call came in a month or so ago, but it's so fitting today as we have yet another storm approaching. Our next call of the evening comes to us from the state of Oregon. The following is Dan's call. Hey, Derek, and uh, all you monsters out there, this is Dan from Oregon. I called before with a secondhand Bigfoot story that was rather long. That uh, was the thing that convinced me that uh, something like Bigfoot just has to be out there. Uh, But this time I wanted to do something that was a firsthand story out of many stories that I personally have had and also that many people have told me over the years of my life. I'm 40, I just turned 40 this year, so many years of my life and um, it began at a very early age. I'm not absolutely positive why, but I think maybe I know why. This also, you know, me having so many different experiences and maybe having people drawn to me, but anyway, to tell me those stories. If it hadn't been for those people, I don't know if I'd be sharing this with, uh, <clears throat> you know, people that I don't know. If I hadn't heard it from people I'd met or came across in my life. But anyway, uh, first-hand story. Uh, not in chronological order as far as my life goes, but I wanted to share it because there was more than one person. It was me and three other people experienced this at the same time or witnessed this. I don't know if it's really an experience anyway. We're just uh, hanging out at my house in uh, Beaverton, northwest Portland, Oregon. And these guys are all musicians. We played music together. We were hanging out on a summer, I think it was Saturday, Friday, or Saturday night, playing music. And um, 
being goofy, drinking beer. Uh, but, you know, we were drinking cheap, watery beer. Uh, and, you know, we're all musicians and had been for years. <laughs> Even at this point, this is like 11, 12 years ago. Uh, so, suffice it to say, we were experienced. We were drunk enough to be goofy, but certainly not drunk in any way, intoxicated. Um, anyway, one of our friends, James, had just gotten a camera that he was all stoked about, video camera. And when we got bored of playing music, we started putting on helmets and all just being ridiculous and making spoof music videos with this camera that he got. And he was all stoked about it because it had night vision on it. And it was, as far as night vision goes, it was okay. Not stellar, but it was all right. Anyway, uh, we decided to walk down to the store and get more uh, watery beer and smokes or whatever. The three of us, and he decided to take the camera. And as we're walking down the street, he's, you know, we're all checking it out and switching between normal vision and night vision to see, you know, what the difference between the picture. And eventually we lose interest in that. We're up ahead of him, and he's filming us and we're being all goofy as I recall and uh, we get about halfway down to 185th Avenue we're walking down Parkview Boulevard headed towards 185th Avenue in Northwest and um, we're about halfway to, to 185th and we're going to cut across the park and go to the 7-Eleven right there if you want to look it up or if you know the area anyway he's looking at stuff with night vision and he stops and says dude check this out I can see something in the sky in night vision that I can't see with the naked eye or with the normal vision on the camera. So we go back and we look at it, and the thing in the sky, we can see it moving, but it's moving very erratic, kind of like a bug, like a, like a, uh, like a, you see a mosquito that doesn't have any blood to suck. It's just kind of hovering, moving around, kind of short and jagged sometimes, long and jagged, you know, just very erratic, nothing to do. That's kind of what it looked like, never really stood still. It was like red, reddish orange in color and streaky all over the sky. And immediately we thought, well, it looks like a bug, you know, but we did all these tests, you know, tallest guy that was with us stood, you know, in between us and we moved to get a lamp post and then the trees that were way down at the other end of the park down by 185th um, it were in between you know, it those blocked it when we got it in between us, and it just kind of danced around the sky in over a vast area. We figured out it was a long ways away, but we still thought, you know, it's no matter how still any of us tried to hold it, it maybe it was one of us. So um, we put it on the ground in the middle of the street it was at night, you know, summer night. The road's not really, you know, heavily trafficked. Anyway, we put it on the ground and put something under it to aim it at the sky and sure enough it was moving around it was moving more when we were holding it but it was still moving very erratic and all over the sky it just never stopped just all over the place bounce 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 move 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 it just it was just moving very erratically it was a, this, this streak a reddish orange streak in the sky and you know so what do you do with that i guess you just record it you know so he did james did and we just went to the store and we came back and as i recall we checked for it again and it was still there just kind of dancing around in the sky um, moving a great distance you know faster and farther than at least publicly known conventionally made human made aircraft can do and it didn't I mean it was hard to tell what it was whatever it was it was big and at least you know um, I don't know infrared or something luminescent I don't know night vision luminescent so so maybe you know very black but reflecting you know light that we can't really see with our naked eye um but it, it looks you know like i said more like a bug flying around but it was very very clear that it was way up in like me you know way up in the sky maybe like the upper atmosphere way up so which would have made it very big um and you know so it, but if it was like an alien or interdimensional spacecraft or whatever they had a really bad pilot it was just super erratic or like an interdimensional teenager that took his dad's hot rod out for a ride and doesn't know how to use a manual or something but it just didn't i don't know it looked like a i don't know what it was it, organic maybe it would be the word um like some sort of possible intelligence behind it but not i don't know more like a creature or an organism or something but anyway we saw it on the way back went home and 
told my girlfriend at the time about it, told other people about it, and, um, you know, but what do you do with it? What do you, what do you make of that? And anyway, unfortunately, James moved to California. Uh, I talked to him a couple times after that. I know the other two guys talked to him a couple times after that. And, uh, yeah, after that, we all lost touch with him, as far as I know. Nobody that knows him as well knows how to get a hold of him. So, if uh, you happen to hear this, James, or you've heard this story from somebody named James, uh, pass on the word, and hopefully he still has that video to pass it along and test it with my memory. But I'm pretty sure, you know, that it was it was just there. I'm pretty sure my memory is pretty accurate of that, and it was... Uh, you know, four of us, me and three other people, witnessed it. But uh, anyway, man, yeah, uh, love what you do. The idea is great. Um, I've been binge listening to the podcast for a while now. I'm into season six, so I guess I'm creeping up on catching up, which is sad because I like binge binging your show. But I'm glad for the success and even more glad for... The outreach so uh keep up the good work god bless you and the crew and all the monster listeners out there take care thank you dan early on in your call you'd mentioned that the paranormal seems to find you and i can't help but notice that most of the callers that call into the show fall under this category of um people that seem to be surrounded by this sort of activity in one way or another now as i always say there are two types of people on this planet. There are those that are constantly aware of their surroundings and those that sort of float through life. Uh, those are the ones that will not notice a new wall was painted or a giant scratch on the side of their car. They're just simply in their own head and oblivious to what's going on around them. Well, it's the first group that often reports these sort of encounters. And in my opinion, the simple reason is that they are looking. Now, perhaps it's not that simple, but that certainly seems to be the case for me. Most of the quote-unquote paranormal things I've experienced in my life happened because I was paying attention. I was looking in my peripheral vision. I was paying attention to a strange sound that I heard or, or so on and so forth. So to me, that's the difference. And if you're one of those people that claim to be paranormal kryptonite, open your mind a bit. And I don't mean like spiritually or anything like that. I mean literally open your mind, open your eyes, open your ears, and do your best to pay attention to things that take place around you. Uh, I'm rambling, but the point I'm getting at is that if you pay attention, this stuff will find you. Trust me. Now, as for the actual recording, I would love to see this. So if you were that cameraman, please shoot me an email, hit us up on the Facebook page, or give us a call. I'd love to get my eyes on that. Thank you again, Dan, for taking the time to share your call. Before I get to the final call of the evening, I have a few things to share with you. Be sure to hit up the shop. Visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and click on the Shop tab. There you'll find magnets, hats, t-shirts, stickers, and each month I'm trying to add something new. So keep visiting back and see if there's anything there that catches your eye. We are hurtling toward 1,500 reviews. 1,500. Now, I, I'll be honest, I can't even fathom that amount of people that sat down, took the time to rate and review this show, but I am extremely thankful for each and every one of you, even the bad reviews. Some of those I actually learned from, so they're not the end of the world. So if you haven't yet left a review, please visit iTunes or wherever it is you leave reviews and do so today. And for those of you wondering how to submit your story, you can simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. The number is toll-free, and the line is open 24-7. You can also email me at monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com, or you can click on the Report Your Sightings tab on the website to submit anonymously. And I have one last announcement, and this is me, and this is my voice from the future with one last announcement. As I was editing today's episode, I uh, touched base with Justin and Jen from Season 6, Episode 3, The Glimmer Man Story. We're setting up an interview for next week where we're going to do a deep dive 
an episode that will be available on Patreon. If you're not a Patreon subscriber and you would like to be, head on over to patreon.com and just search for Monsters Among Us podcast or check the show notes for tonight's episode for a direct link. $4 a month gets you access to two episodes a month, a deep dive into a past call. Uh, In this particular instance, it'll be Justin and Jen's call about their Glimmer Man experience. And then the second episode, which will be tomorrow's released episode, will be a look at the paranormal news for the previous month. So again, if that's something you're interested in, visit patreon.com and search for the show. Back to your regularly scheduled broadcast. And I think that's enough announcements for one night, so let's get to our final call of the evening. The following story comes to us from Darren in the state of Arkansas. And although I haven't heard this story, the title has me quite intrigued. The following story was titled, Aqua Dog. Hello, my name is Darren and I live in Northwest Arkansas. And this isn't my experience, but it's something that happened to my father when he was a kid. When my dad was around 12 years old, he and a friend went to go fish Lake Flint Creek, which is also called Lake Swepco, due to the power company being located on its shores. As soon as they were unloading the small boat into the water, my dad could see a large animal on the shoreline a little bit away from the boat ramp. This thing looked like a dog with very thick wool-like fur on its body and rounded ears and a snout. This itself isn't unusual. My dad just thought it was a dog, but then it did something that neither my dad nor his friend could explain. It started walking into the lake with every step it submerged itself more and more until it was completely under the water. It didn't float, it didn't swim, it just walked right under. They saw a couple bubbles where it entered and then the water was still again. They never saw the animal come up for air. The lake itself is small, but where they were at, there was no place hidden from from my dad where it could come up for air without being seen. No trees near the shore and no hidden piece of shoreline that it could have gone to. To this day, My dad cannot identify what exactly the animal was, nor can he explain the behavior. He said they contacted the nearby drive-thru safari, but all their animals were accounted for. My dad isn't into anything paranormal or cryptozoological, so he doesn't think of it as anything more than a weird occurrence. Both my dad and I are familiar with local wildlife and can pretty easily identify any animal that we might come across, but neither of us can think of what this animal was. He said it looked the most like a hyena, but with a thick, woolly coat. We looked up some pictures, and he said it was similar, but still not exactly the same. Even if it was a hyena escaped from the nearby safari, why would it submerge itself without swimming or coming up for air? It's just strange. So not a particularly long or exciting story, but I hope you found it interesting. I love the podcast. Keep up the good work. And I hope you can use this. Thanks. You can cut this part out, but I wanted to let you know that I run my own paranormal podcast called Snipe Hunt Frightening Folklore. Please check it out if you get the chance. Thanks. Thank you, Darren. This is a strange story, because it sounds like the creature that was described is not an aquatic creature, although the behavior described certainly belongs to that of an aquatic creature. So the only real, uh, I guess, suggestion I would have is uh, that of an alligator snapping turtle. Now, before anybody laughs at this suggestion, hear me out. Alligator snapping turtles are massive. These things reach weights of, uh, I believe, 75 to 100 pounds. So they could easily be a couple feet across. And they can also be at least a foot or so tall. Now, another thing that may help support the theory that this is a snapping turtle of some sort is the fact that most turtles, if you've seen them up close, are completely covered in algae and moss. Some of the turtles I caught as kids were uh, just as fuzzy as like a puppy or something like that, only they were green. So perhaps the, uh, I guess the flowing uh, woolly coat that was described by Darren is uh, maybe moss of some sort. But I'm sure that he would have mentioned that it was green in color. So the action described by uh, Darren is exactly what I would expect from an alligator snapping turtle. It would simply walk up to the water and slide right in, almost exactly as described. 
Now, of course, there is a ton of detail in Darren's story that does not exactly coincide with the theory that this was a snapping turtle. So I'm just going to kind of leave this out here. I'm not by any means suggesting that that's what this creature was, but it is something worth looking at. Now, speaking of other podcasts, longtime listeners Tara and Aristotle have their own show, and it's remarkably similar to what I'm doing here. So more on that, here's their promo. Hey, Monsters Among Us fans. I'm Tara. And I'm Aristotle. We make a little podcast called Fan Story. Each week, we share stories of musical love and exploration. We're producing a special fan-sourced episode. We need your stories. These don't have to be epic stories about getting stuck in an elevator with Steven Tyler's mother. Or crowd surfing at Lady Gaga. Although those kinds of stories are welcome. Sometimes it's just about how you discovered your favorite band accidentally or went in blind for the best show you've ever seen. We want to hear what movie you. Aside from things that go bump in the night, we want to hear what makes the human spirit lift. It's as simple as that. Do you always feel like somebody's watching you? That's a Rockwell reference, Monster Guys. Send us your stories to stories at fanstorypodcast.com and your fan story could be a part of the growing and rich tapestry of love and fandom for our show. You can find us on all the platforms at fanstorypodcast. Don't forget to subscribe and rate us on iTunes. Preferably five stars. Check out Fan Story because we, we are, are listening. listening. Thank Thanks. So be sure to check out both Darren, Tara, and Aristotle's podcast. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Warren Pon Abbott, Addie Lloyd, and Tony Bell. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And music for this episode was provided by MyU and Coag Music. Thank you all for listening, and until next week. Tonight's secret story comes to us from Maddie, from Parts Unknown. Hi Derek, I'm Maddie. I'm 13, and I have, I think, a Shadow Man experience, or haunted house thing. I will jump right in. A bit of background on the house. My house is built on top of the ruins of an old 1860s farmhouse, where my great-great-uncle Robert passed away as an infant. I will start from the smaller experiences to the bigger ones. So a few months ago, I started hearing weird knocking noises, and out of the corner of my eye I would see tall shadows reaching to the ceiling. Through these months, the air felt dark and depressing, like there was an air of sadness. I would only see this stuff while I was alone, and things only got weirder from there. I always thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but I started to doubt that theory. One extremely overcast day in October, I was going down the stairs to the first floor of my house. I was probably on the sixth step from the floor when I saw this curled up baby on the bottom step. I looked at it for about five seconds and then I took another step down, then it disappeared. I was so freaked out I wouldn't hardly go anywhere alone, but in some cases I wasn't alone when I would see the paranormal stuff. As it would happen, it was around 9 o'clock p.m when me and my sister decided to go into our room that we shared. My sister was ahead of me the whole time and reached our room before me. That was when I got this uneasy feeling that I was being watched from behind. I quickly turned around and saw this dark, tall humanoid figure about three feet away from me. It was wearing an old-timey suit and top hat. I would have assumed that it was a person, but then I noticed that I could see right through its face. Where there was supposed to be skin, there was nothingness totally see-through. I was just standing there. I would have thought it was watching me if it had any eyes. 
It had no distinguishable facial features. We stood there looking at each other for about two seconds before I, I got over my shock and told my sister, Look! She poked her head outside the door, but the thing had already disappeared. After that, the air seemed lighter and less depressing. I have seen nothing else since, and I'm actually very grateful that I haven't. I don't know why I stopped seeing these things, but I'm happy that it's over. I don't know if you can use this story, but I would love to know if you have any theories about whatever this stuff was. Maybe I was hallucinating. Anyway, love the podcast. Thank you, Maddie. Well, thank you, Maddie. It certainly sounds like what you're dealing with may be the Shadow Man or Hat Man phenomena. I'm sure in future episodes we will dive deeper on this phenomenon. But for the time being, there are several documentaries, countless YouTube videos, and even several other podcasts that cover this subject. So I'm sure you can stumble upon some information if you dug deep enough. Thank you again, Maddie, for taking the time to share that story. And thank you for sticking around to the end of the show. Have a good night.